it all that's within me Shout out, shout out Bless the Lord on my soul
If you'd open your Bibles to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, and, and I'm going to do something a little different this morning as I get ready to read this text. I want everyone that has a call on your life to teach or preach the gospel to stand as I read this, because it's a charge to ministers. Would you stand? Bless you. 
Hear the word of God. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at His appearing and His kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be turned into fables. And I give this charge to all of you from the Apostle Paul in the name of Jesus Christ. You may be seated. If ever there's a time when this scripture is fulfilled, it's today. Some of the things that are spoken and preached and taught are really appalling to the Holy Spirit. And anything that is not in agreement with the written word is not of God. And, and if you'll just go to the third chapter of 2 Timothy now, back up and start at the 13th verse, notice again the warnings of the Scriptures, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And from a child, from a child, thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. I want you to notice in the Word of God that God's Word is not just to tell you what a good person you are. There are preachers that are very popular today because all they tell you is what wonderful plans the Lord has for you. But I found out something about being a father, that my father had good plans for me if I was obedient. <laughs> my disobedience... <laughs> could bring a little detour in the good plans. A little detour to the woodshed, if you will. A little detour where the belt came through the loops. I still remember that. And he still had good plans for me, but I had to reach the criterion to receive those good plans. Now, this isn't popular teaching because the new teaching on grace is that once you're saved, there doesn't need to be a transformation or a change because God's grace, He loves you just the way you are, and so you might as well stay that way. I like how Max Licato said it. God loves you just the way you are, but He loves you too much to leave you there. And so God's Word comes to us to change us. I don't know about you, but if I'm not doing something right and getting negative results, I want to know how to fix that. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't intend to just continue on the path. We're insane as human beings sometimes. We keep doing the same things over and over that we get negative results from. <coughs> Excuse me. And we wonder why it still works the same. Okay, supposing you were given a test by a teacher at school. And that test, you got certain answers wrong, but the teacher was gracious enough to let you retest until you passed. Would you keep putting the same answers down that got you to flunk it in the first place? Now, I want you to know something. Your teacher, the Holy Spirit, gives you tests. Here's the good news. It's an open book test. Isn't that great? All the answers are there. Why do you keep giving the same wrong answers? And you say, like the children of Israel, didn't we see that rock before? Haven't we been this way before? And how many know they went around in circles for 40 years because they wouldn't learn? <laughs> Tell the person next to you, listen to this, you need it. Thank you, Larry. Now, 
He gives four areas that the Word of God is profitable. Everybody say profitable. <laughs> we talk about success and profit and prosperity. And the Bible says, I would that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. So making a profit is a good thing, right? And so if we'll listen to what the Word has to say, it will profit us. It will help us. It will bring good success, Joshua says, into our life. Amen? So, number one, he said, doctrine. Do you know what you believe this morning? <clears throat> if a couple of those fellows knock at your door from either of those groups, <laughs> do you know the Word well enough to talk to them? Can you open that false New World translation of the Scriptures so-called and show them that 1 John 1, 1, or, or St. John 1.1 1, 1 is wrong in their book? Who gives them the audacity to change the Word of God to suit their cultish beliefs? But if you don't know in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God, capital G, you'll believe their translation that says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was a God, little g. So now you got a big God and a little God. When the Bible says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Amen? Don't look at me in that strange tone of voice. I've heard people say, Don't preach doctrine. Doctrine divides the body of Christ. Not true doctrine. True doctrine, I'll get this right in a minute, unites us around the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? True doctrine brings unity. False doctrine brings confusion and division. Jesus preached doctrine. He said in John 7, 16 through 17, And Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Doctrine is not the preacher's opinion. Amen. Amen. We all have opinions. There's such a thing as an informed opinion and an uninformed opinion. When I was having heart issues, I had more value of the cardiologist's opinion than the fellow that met me at the back of the church and said the Holy Spirit told him all I needed was Maalox. <laughs> you, you find some funny things out when you go through illnesses. Uh, people say some things that really surprise you, which you, you don't know until you get there, you know. And I thought, church people don't say things like, well, yes, they do. But what I'm saying is the cardiologist has studied in his field of expertise, and so his opinion carries more value than the Maalox guy. Amen. So when it comes to the Word of God, don't just trust people's opinion... But no, if it is the Word. Jesus said, I'm not speaking of my own. I don't say anything unless I hear the Father say it. I don't do anything unless I see the Father do it. And He said He taught doctrine. And there are doctrines of the church that are absolutely essential that you know and that you believe. Amen? I, I, I was uh, watching uh, a minister that I had a lot of respect for. I read his books and... He had a big conference, and in that conference, he played clips of the kind of worship that you saw this morning, and then began to mock it, ridiculed it. And if you don't know the word, what he said would might make sense to you. And what he said appealed to the intellect, but not the spirit. Anybody know the difference? He said, mindless, mindless. It's just repetition of phrases in that form of worship. And you should never have repetition of phrases. I challenge him to look in the book of Isaiah and around the throne, there's repetition of phrase. Holy, holy, holy. Sometimes when I get in his presence, I do like my daddy used to do. My daddy used to just say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. Woo, there's power. In His name. And if you think the song was too long this morning, 700 years later, John the Revelator looked in to the throne room and they hadn't even changed yet. They were still singing, Holy, Holy, Holy. 
And I looked in the Psalms and it's His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. His mercy endureth forever. Aren't you glad? Doesn't that bear repeating? The minister went on to say, if you stand in that kind of atmosphere and say, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord, you could become demon-possessed. Respected minister. Thousands of preachers listening to him. That's what, I'm just going to say it, that's what John MacArthur said. Here's what Jesus said in Luke chapter 11. If any of you fathers, if your son would ask him a fish, would he give him a serpent? If he asked for an egg, would he give him a scorpion? How much, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, everybody say, how much more? How much more will not your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask? Give the Lord praise. So you can agree with this well-known preacher who's bringing division to the body of Christ. You say, aren't you doing the same? No, I'm not. I think we need to unite over the things we agree on. Too much friendly fire in the church. Or you can agree with the Psalms that tells you to lift your hands and repeats phrases over and over. The Psalms that tells you to shout. The Psalms that tells you to dance before the Lord. And the Word of God that says even now to lift your hands and to shout and to praise and to sing. And the Bible says, Jesus said, if you say, fill me, Lord, fill me, Lord, He would never allow an evil presence to come into you. How many trust the Father that much? Just want to be real this morning. Do you believe and know who Jesus is? That's a doctrine. Some people will tell you He's just a good man. He can't be just a good man. Were He a good man, He'd be the biggest liar. If He wasn't who He said He was, He'd be a liar. How many of you can't be a liar and a good man too? If you don't think He was a liar and you don't believe that He's God in the flesh, then you must believe He's a deluded idiot or a psycho. So, who is Jesus to you? What does your doctrine say about Jesus? I said to somebody not long ago, a lot of things I don't understand. A lot of things baffle me, even in the Scriptures. Anybody willing to admit that? I don't understand some things God does, and I don't understand why He don't do some things. I wish He would. I don't know why He doesn't realize that I should be able to advise Him. But I do know this. All the critics of Jesus Christ have lives that are a mess. And no one has ever lived a miserable life emulating the life of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. No one has ever been worse off for serving Jesus and loving Jesus. Now you might be worse off if you follow a false Christ, but if you'll serve the Jesus of the New Testament, let me tell you something. He came to give you life and to give it more abundantly. He sets you free from addictions. He draws you into His presence. Hallelujah. He instructs you on how to have a good family and how to be blessed. And any, anybody else you emulate, you become a carbon copy of them. But when you emulate Jesus Christ, you become more the real person He created you to be and more of an individual. Nobody can match that. Look at the lives of His critics. (laughs) And I choose Jesus. Man, I choose choose the Holy Ghost conceived, (laughs) virgin-born, eternal, God manifest in the flesh, Son of God, to be my Lord and Savior. Really, I don't. He chose me. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? See, sometimes as preachers, and this is what confused me as a kid, every time the preacher had an opinion, he preached it as doctrine. Had everything to do with your haircut to the length of your sleeves. Even the height of the heels on your shoes. And I'm going to tell you something. That's just hogwash. They preach things as doctrine that were not scriptural. They'd take one little verse out of context and try to control people with it. Matter of fact, Jesus addressed that. Let me show you what He says about people who preach their opinions as doctrine. Matthew 15, 8 and 9, This people draw nigh to Me with their mouth and honor Me with their lips, but their heart is far from Me. In vain, everybody say in vain, I want you to get this. 
do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Amen. Jesus said, if you are following the commandments of men and not the Word of God, your worship is in vain. Oh, I could talk about a lot of different things here. Folks, I'm not saying we should divide over every little doctrinal issue. I've seen too much division in the body of Christ. But one thing we must agree on, and that is the person and the character and the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to agree that these scriptures in their original languages are the inspired word of God. God breathed. You might, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm post or I'm pre-trib rapture all the way. I believe very soon the trumpet's going to sound. Hallelujah. The dead in Christ will raise, raise first so other churches may beat us. <laughs> Just kidding. And we that are alive and remain will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, if you believe mid-trib or post-trib, you believe Jesus is coming, at, just believe He's coming. You're still my brother and sister, right? We can have difference of belief on the right way to take communion. But let me tell you something. We better know how to commune with Him through the Holy Spirit. So there are some doctrines that are essential and some that are just, you know, we'll all keep the unity of the faith, Paul said in Ephesians, till we come to that one faith. The unity of the Spirit till we come to that one faith. Amen. But there's some things you just don't compromise on. Like Acts 4.12. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Well, pastor, I think all paths lead to the same God. That's as ridiculous as saying that all roads, any direction, lead to Buchanan. They don't. They lead to many other places. <laughs> and Lord, I just leave that at that. Amen. Doctrine. Ask the person next to you, do you know what you believe? Now, I know we need to know who we believe in, but it's important to know what you believe. And, and, and have Bible to back it up. Oh, that's what the preacher said. <laughs> I heard over and over growing up this. The Holy Spirit will not dwell in an unclean temple. So I thought that was a Bible verse. You know it's not? Did you know if we had to be all clean and perfect to have the Holy Spirit resident residing in us that none of us would be worthy? Amen. How many thank God through the blood you've been made worthy? The truth of the matter is, if the Bible says don't defile the temple of the Holy Spirit, God will destroy you. And the Holy Spirit comes into you, resident in you, and you go doing things you ought not to do. He doesn't leave. How many's ever been backslid? And you know He's still talking to you, still dealing with you, still touching your heart in the middle of the night. Amen. I don't mean it's okay, but aren't you glad He don't leave you when you mess up? There have been times I'd say, Lord, I wish you'd leave me alone right now, and then I'd get scared, but, 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 but not forever. <laughs> I had several preachers here in West Virginia say, oh, before the Lord comes back, you won't be able to tell the summer for the winter. Got news for you, that's not in the Bible. The Bible teaches just the opposite. God's covenant with Noah, as long as the earth remaineth, summer and winter, cold and heat, seed time and harvest, will not cease. Amen. So aren't you worried about global warming? No, because I know it's coming. I know it's coming that the elements are going to melt with a fervent heat. It ain't coming like they think it's coming, though. Uh, I'm not politically correct. If you're looking for that, go somewhere else. Amen. Amen. Matters what you believe. Matters what you believe about marriage. God designed and ordained. But see, if you don't believe in Genesis and you don't believe in creation, then it don't matter what marries what. But if you believe there's an ordination, <laughs> then you can see there's a design. Amen. If I said enough, am I clear enough? Even a plumber knows how male and female parts fit together. What's wrong with people? I'm not popular with this. Reproof. <laughs> you thought doctrine was tough. <laughs> Reproof. 
Can I read you a few verses about reproof from Proverbs chapter 15, verse 12? A scorner loves not the one who reproves him, neither will he go to the wise. <laughs> so you can find a church where they'll tell you you're wonderful no matter what you're doing, just the way you are. And if you don't have any sense, you'll just eat that up. <laughs> I want to know when I'm messing up. I want to know when I'm off track. And I've got news for you. When I'm up here preaching the Word of God, it don't just hit you. It hits me too. I'm human too. I fail too. I have issues too. Now don't look at me like you don't. Matter of fact, just to be honest, look at the person next to you and say, I have issues. <laughs> that was good for you. And I'm sure your wife said, you certainly do. Proverbs 9, 8 and 9. Reprove not a scorner lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man and he'll love you. Give instruction to a wise man and he will be yet wiser. Teach a just man and he will increase in learning. And one of the most sobering verses on this is Proverbs 29, 1. He that being often reproved and hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed and that without remedy. Do you know, we live in the most headstrong generation I have ever seen. How many remember when you were a teenager and whatever your daddy told you, you didn't think he knew what he was talking about? Mom and dad tried to tell you and you would not take their reproof until circumstances begin to teach you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Man, I'm telling you, I can tell, i got to watch what I say here, identify my kids, but how many has ever tried to give your kids good instruction that would really make life better for them, and they just do the opposite just because they could? Amen. Amen. And, and, and you're thinking, you're, duh, why do you think I'm giving you this advice? Do you think I'm giving you this advice because I love to have conflict with you? I think your kids think that sometimes. They just want to yell at me. No, we don't want you playing in traffic for a reason. <laughs> we don't want you driving a car with bald tires 95 miles an hour the wrong way down a one-way street for a reason. <laughs> God gives you reproof for a reason. <laughs> Amen? Amen. How many appreciate the fact that God's Word sometimes reproves you? Because sometimes I feel justified in my attitude towards certain people. <laughs> They've gotten on my last nerve. Everything they do is wrong. And, and you know, and, and I, can even, I can even get a Bible verse. I think even God's mad at them. <laughs> I read about the wrath of God in the Psalms on those kind of people. And then I get in the Word... And the Word says, <laughs> love your enemies. Do you get to them that despitefully use you? Consider your spirit. <laughs> What's your attitude? And, and the Word begins to reprove me. And I realize, hey, I'm the one that needs an attitude adjustment. Amen? Anybody, does the Word do that for you? I remember one time when I was newly married, I, I, had, to, I had my Bible out. And I was going to show my wife how wrong she was. She was in the kitchen doing dishes, and I was getting scriptures about how a wife ought to be. <laughs> Funny about it, I didn't want to read that one that I was supposed to love her like Christ loved the church. <laughs> and I flipped over into Malachi and just caught a verse, and God spoke to me through it, even though it isn't perfectly the context. It said, you've dealt treacherously against the wife of your youth. You, can, you consider your spirit. I'm going to tell you something. If I'd have went on in there and jumped on her with the Scriptures with, attitude, with that attitude that I had, it would have wounded something in her and it would have bolstered the wrong spirit in me. How I many know we don't use the Word as a club on our loved ones? Instead, we use it to... And, and the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, reproved me. And I needed it. Another time, I was standing in the front of the church... And a little lady was praying over me in the old sanctuary when it first opened. And she said, oh, dear Father, 
help my pastor with his anger issues. <laughs> Give him control over his anger. And here I was the pastor. And she was praying like that for me. And Brother Jim, it made me so mad. <laughs> I'm like... And then the fact that it made me mad made me realize that she was right. <laughs> I needed the reproof. I needed the reproof because if I let my anger go unchecked, it would have marred my relationship with my wife and my children. It would have destroyed my ability to minister effectively if God didn't reprove me and deal with that issue. In the Psalm 50, he deals with those who gossip and justify it. He said, you thought I was just like you, but I'll set you in order. I'll reprove you. How many appreciate God's reproof? Well, what's the difference in reproof and correction? I'm so glad you ask. Reproof tells me what I ought not to do. Correction corrects that so I can do it right. Amen? How many thank God for correction? Matter of fact, I'll say this really quickly. <laughs> You should never punish your kids. Never punish your kids. <laughs> I knew it would get quiet. <laughs> Correct them. Amen. Foolishness is bound in the heart of the child, but the rod of correction drives it far from him. You see, punishment is an end, right? But correction is a means to an end. God doesn't punish His children, He corrects His children. Amen. Isn't that awesome? How many thank God He corrects you? <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. <laughs> Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of His correction. For whom the Lord loveth, He correcteth, even as a father, the son in whom He delighteth. <laughs> Listen to what God says through to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 7, 27 and 28. Therefore thou shalt speak these words unto them, but they won't hearken to thee. <laughs> How many ever tried to tell your kid or somebody something you knew they weren't going to listen? But you just had to tell them anyway because you need to warn them, right? God tells Ezekiel in the 16th chapter, if you don't warn them, their blood will I require at your hands. If you do warn them and they don't listen, you've done your job. You've delivered your soul. So I'm going to warn whether you listen or not. Sometimes God says, you go ahead and tell them. They're not going to listen, but you have to tell them. And sometimes I like to tell you, even if you're not going to listen, so later on I can say, I told you. <laughs> Amen. Speak these words to them. They won't hearken to thee. Thou shalt also call unto them, but they will not answer thee. But thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. And when I read that, at first I smiled. But as I got to the end, it made me kind of tremble inside. Because this is a nation here that will not hear the voice of God and will not receive His correction. God help us if we don't turn and receive it. Amen. And then, after God gives you right doctrine, reproves and corrects you, then He gives you loving instruction. Isn't that awesome? How many appreciate that the Scriptures do this for you? Amen. Instruction in righteousness. Proverbs 23, 12. Apply thy heart to instruction and the ears, thine ears to the words of knowledge. Proverbs 19, 20, and 21. Listen to counsel. Receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. <laughs> old fellow said, too soon old, too late smart. <laughs> Amen. Listen to me, young people, please. I know, I know you, you don't want to hear this, but please listen. If, if, if your grandfather or elders around you try to give you instruction, they are not trying to stifle your fun or ruin your life. They've made some mistakes themselves and they're trying to make it a little easier for you. Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I love this in Psalm 32, 8. Would you stand with me? 
I want to go back over this part of the verse. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. The NIV trans translates it this way. All Scripture is God-breathed. When Paul took up his pen to wrote, the Holy Spirit that hovered over the earth at creation hovered over him, and the breath of God inspired the words. Isn't that incredible? You're not left alone. You have a comforter. Hallelujah. And the Bible promised He'd be your teacher. He teaches through people, but He also speaks in your ear and gives you direction. How many want to receive from the Lord? As you read the Word and the Holy Spirit enlightens that Word, listen to what God says He'll do. Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way that you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Father, we thank You for doctrine, reproof, correction, and instruction. Father, as we come before You, help us to be recipients of Your correction. Help us to thank You that You reprove us because You said in Your Word that if we don't receive correction from You, then we're not Your children. So correct us, Father. Reprove us. But don't just leave us there, Father. Instruct us in the way that we should go so that our ways may be prosperous in You and we'll experience good success. Bless this people this morning as they came here to receive instruction from Your Word. In Jesus' name, these altars are open.